Okay, so you're going to get a lot of progress reviews in the coming days, these next two weeks, because I should hopefully be going to both the Birmingham show and the Manchester show on the Deadly Viper tour, and I need to catch up on all my progress, thus give you reviews and tell you why you should watch progress, because it is a great independent wrestling company. And yes, shall we just get straight into the review? <music> Hello and welcome to FTTR, I am Ewan McQuaid and today we are talking about Progress Wrestling Chapter 1, 3, 6, 24-7. No, not talking about the 24-7 Championship from WWE, instead we are talking about the independent British promotion Progress Wrestling and their continued journey to be one of the best independent wrestling companies on the planet with great storytelling, great matches and great characters. I've given a hint of my thoughts on the show I guess, but overall I would say in terms of Progress history that I have seen starting from the start of this year when I started watching. I would say this is one of the weaker shows in my opinion. There's a few great matches on there but there's some stuff that didn't really connect with me personally. So one of the weaker shows 24-7 but this is my review where I just dive into it. I tell you all the matches, tell you some of the angles, tell you what happened on the show and give you my overall rating at the end the way a review works. So Let's just jump straight into the show. So the show kicked off with Simon Miller opening and giving us a great video package for the upcoming Thunder Bastard match that will be taking place in the main event. For anyone who doesn't know, a Thunder Bastard match is an eight-man elimination match, Royal Rumble style, with people coming in. Really fun concept and twist on the Royal Rumble as a whole. But the first match we got was for the Tag Team Championships, the Progress Tag Team Championships, Sunshine Machine taking on Leon Slater and Ricky Knight Jr. in Match of the Night, to be honest. This was an absolute bomb burner of flippy stuff that I loved watching. Absolutely love watching. Sunshine Machine are an incredible, incredible unit. Great music, great cohesion, absolutely everything they do just works. Got really good personalities and they work well in the ring. And then Ricky Knight Jr. and Leon Slater are two of the best up and coming British wrestlers you will see. And they had a good sort of dichotomy between the two. Leon Slater is the more well-rounded good guy, whereas there's a little bit of edge to Ricky Knight Jr. And he was actually my standout in the match. He had some really, really great spots, really great spots of agility and strength. He worked so well together. He did. He played a bit of the heel in the match as well when they were working over Chuck Mambo. But let's just talk about Sunshine Machine and some of the stuff they did because it was absolutely goddamn fantastic. So I've just got, I've had to grab my phone because there's too many notes in this match for me to go through. So there was a sick shooting star sent on combination from Mambo and TK Cooper. That looked incredible. And then, yeah, just some of the really cool spots that um, Ricky Knight Jr. did. He did a double Samoan drop which looked great he did a double hangman DDT from the apron again that looked great he did a 450 splash and that was broken up by a swanton from TK Cooper it was electric this it was a really solid way to open the show and one of the best tag matches I've seen in ages and I know I said that about the last progress show with the ladder match this wasn't as good as that that ladder match is a match of the year contender but this was a solid, solid way to open the show and really put over Slater and Knight in this, and even in defeat. And I think there's so much, you know, mileage in them as a team, as well as single stars. So I'm incredibly excited to see where they go after Sunshine Machine picked up the win with a, I think it's called the Deep Dive? Designated Driver, a Designated Driver, a Foot Stomp into a Samoan Driver. Fantastic, really great stuff. Can't wait to see where this goes next. Then we got probably the the low light of the show for me. This was the one where I really wasn't connected to it whatsoever. It was supposed to be Tom Dawkins taking on LK Mazinga, I think is how his name is pronounced. But Tom Dawkins is injured, so he can't actually be at the show. Instead, this was a pretty heavy comedy match. I'm not too into Zinga's sort of gimmick with the bowling ball and stuff like that. It was very heavily played for comedy. And Big Guns Joe, I think, is great, but maybe his sort of personality and his character isn't as well-rounded as maybe I would like. I think there's a little bit more depth that can be found there. And there wasn't really any sort of blow-away spots. I thought it was fun, them doing the are you worthy thing with the bowling ball. I thought that was interesting. But again, it sort of didn't mesh with everything else on the show and doing this sort of very goofy comedy, which we can see done well as 
will follow in the next match. This just didn't hit the mark for me. And yeah, Big Guns Joe picked up the win. I think that's continuing a losing streak for LK Menzinger. And we'll see where it goes. But overall, I thought this was an okay match that didn't really need to be on the show, in my opinion. Then we got a backstage promo because this show was played with injuries and just things going wrong. So Tom Dawkins wasn't on the show and Swerve Strickland wasn't on the show. He was supposed to be facing Nick Wayne. So instead, Nick Wayne took on Robbie X and this was set up in a backstage promo, which was really good. Robbie X is really cool. Nick Wayne's really good. I forgot I knew who Nick Wayne was. He's the guy who signed for AEW and he's 17 goddamn years old. Jesus Christ, I feel old. But shall we move on from that? Then we got a sort of comedy match done right, and that was Charles Crowley taking on Maggot. Now, these two are almost two sides of the same coin, both very theatrical characters, and they both wanted to outdo each other in this. And that was essentially, you know, Charles Crowley's downfall. So it started off with them just trying to outdo each other. They would do, you know, each would slap each other, they would then spit in the other one's face. They repeated the dance spot from the previous match at Super Strong Style. But... It ultimately came to a head when Crowley had the win. Crowley had the win. He'd got the three count, but he raised the arm of Maggot away from the mat and went to hit another move after Maggot had dressed up in all the attire that Crowley wears, the top hat, the sort of cropped jacket and stuff like that. And that's when Maggot picked up the win. Crowley got too confident. He went to the top rope. He went for a huge, I think, frog splash and then got caught with a leaping cutter from Maggot. Maggot picked up the win there in what was a solid match and a solid story. I really like the story they told with this. I love seeing, you know, two very similar wrestlers go at each other. It's almost as fun as two very opposite wrestlers going at each other. But this was like, you know, Joker and Batman kind of thing. Maybe not that. Maybe more like Superman and um, Bizarro, that kind of thing. Maybe not necessarily Joker and Batman. But I really enjoyed this. I thought this was a really solid match and it was comedy done right at the start because it escalated from the comedy into the seriousness and that's what got me hooked by the end. So really solid match from both guys. Then we got who's the flippiest man? Nick Wayne versus Robbie X in what was an absolute barn burner, probably second best match of the night. It's up there with um, the opener, but there was just some incredible stuff in this. This was just insane speed after insane speed move everything it's so hard to keep track nick wayne did a dragon suplex into a code red that was just like lightning quick super smooth and then he hit a probably my favorite sequence of the entire match he hit a springboard canadian destroyer onto robbie x which robbie x no sold ran back hit a knee which just looked in incredible and then that wasn't even the end of the match because there was more stuff coming like suicide dives topes everything it was a balls to the walls flippy match that I absolutely loved. And yeah, it ended not with a definitive finish because Nick rolled up Robbie X for the pin in sort of like a crucifix pin kind of combination. And he picked up the win over Robbie X, which I thought was interesting considering Robbie X was in the main event. He was in the Thunder Bastard match. But it was a shock win for him and we got a heel turn teased by Robbie X. He kicks away the hand of Nick Wayne as he goes for a handshake and instead embraces him with a hug. Great sign of respect from Robbie X, a legend of the British indie scene and passing the torch over to Nick Wayne and sort of, you know, endorsing him. Really great stuff. Really loved it and it was a fantastic match from top to bottom. Then we got the announcement that Effie will be at a progress show. Um, milkshakes and cheeseburgers, I think it's called. I think it's after the Cardiff one. It's very soon, I know that. Matt Cardone is on the show as well. And he was interrupted by Tate Mayfair. Tate Mayfair cut a promo. That'll be the match at that, that show. And then we got Raven Creed taking on Alexis Falcon and Lana Austin and Eliza Alexander. So that is a tag match. And... This for me, I'm into. I'm, I'm quite into the Lana Austin Raven Creed storyline. I think it's been going pretty well, and it's heading for a blow off. I think this tag match, this match was mainly just about Lana Austin, which I'm not going to complain about because Lana Austin is great character wise. But Raven Creed and Alexis Falcon definitely took a back seat in this one to the um, the drama between Eliza Alexander and. Lana Austin. Those two worked incredibly well together. Really good bickering back and forth and Lana Austin sort of, you know, 
sneaking in there to get a pin or throwing Eliza Alexander in harm's way. I thought that was really good stuff, really good character work. The match itself was fun enough. It was mainly built around Austin and Alexander working over Alexis Falcon, building to that Raven Creed hot tag, which we were waiting for. We wanted to just get our hands on Lana Austin. And that's the way it went, pretty much. There was a cool spot where Raven Creed got straight jacketed to the ring post, which I thought looked good. It was a good visual. And then it ended with Lana Austin throwing Eliza Alexander off um, Alexis Falcon and getting the pin, which I think is really good. Furthers the character of Lana Austin, potentially sets up a feud with Eliza Alexander, which I think would be great because those two are both great talkers. And we never got the definitive finish to the Raven Creed storyline, which is coming down the line. So incredibly excited to see where this goes. It was a fun, solid tag match. Then we've got the match for the Progress World Championship. We've got Dean Allmark taking on Chris Ridgway in a match that I thought was solid enough. I think the issue with this match is particularly just this is probably just with me, is that I'd seen it very recently because I believe these two clashed at Super Strong Style. So this is quite fresh in my memory. And this didn't feel like it added that much to the story other than furthering that Chris Ridgway is a bastard who kicks people's heads in. We're like I enjoy that as a character trait and the way he's presented himself has been really cool. But the way he the way the match went, it didn't feel as, you know, different as it should feel. It didn't have that extra flavour for me personally. It was solid enough, solid in ring work, and the ending was really good where it's just Chris Ridgway kicking the piss out of Dean Allmark and then he kicks the head, hits a brain buster, one, two, three. Great way to end, great, you know, Great character work from Ridgeway in general, but it wasn't the sort of blowaway match that I was hoping for. Not too many crazy memorable spots in this, and yeah, a little bit disappointed here with this one. And yeah, I'm excited to see where Chris Ridgeway goes next with the title. I believe I know. I think I've seen spoilers, but I'm ext- I'm excited to see how that plays out and how they make it work. So, a little bit underwhelmed with this one, to be honest. And sadly, speaking of underwhelmed, Kanji versus Laura Di Matteo for me, for the Progress Women's Championship, was a little bit, it didn't feel like it was running on all cylinders, which I get, it's the first match in a series with what happened after, and I can see where it's going, like they're probably going to add steps and stuff like that to this to make it a bit more exciting and blood feudy. It was quite technical to begin with, and then it broke down into some strikes and stuff like that, but again, there weren't that many memorable spots other than the finish, and the finish was... Kanji hitting his spinning back elbow and knocking out Laura Di Matteo. It went to a TKO. And I thought that was an interesting way to cap off the match, sort of coming from out of nowhere. And then the post-match sort of ruined it because I didn't necessarily like the way they took Kanji in that she was like, oh, I'm sorry, I, I knocked you out. You know, I didn't mean to do that. Because that sort of raises questions like, oh... Chris Ridgway was punting people in the last match and clearly knocking them out senseless, like, raises that question. And then it raises, well, you want to be a badass. Surely the whole thing is about knocking people out in a wrestling match. I I mean, maybe it's just a character trait of hers, but I feel like it might end up potentially like Bailey in the Alexa Bliss feud where she was scared of a kendo stick, and that's not the direction I want Kanji to go. I think Kanji should be a growing badass, personally. And maybe that's what we'll get because Laura Di Matteo turned heel. She clocked Kanji and we got a heel beat down on Kanji, which hopefully fuels the fire under the dragon. And we get a lot more stuff, more badass stuff from Kanji and potentially a really cool match down the line when these two clash again. So I'm excited to see where it goes, but the match didn't really blow me away, to be honest with you. And finally, we've got the main event. We've got the Thunder Bastard match. This match, as I've said, I said the rules at the beginning. Let's just get straight into it. So entering at number one, we had Gene Money, and then we had Axel Tischer at number two. Now, this was... Gene Money got a really funny promo at the beginning where he was saying, like, we've seen Royal Rumbles. If we actually just teamed up, we could potentially win this. And Axel Tischer had none of it, instead electing to chop Gene Money in the face. And then out at number three, we had Kid Lycos come out. And Lycos was replaced by Kid Lycos 2. They went straight in. 
went straight for both guys and got clocked. Clocked for his sins and Tisha and Money went back to beating each other up, which I thought was, you know, really fun. Really fun way to do it. And then we got number four. Number four, which was um, Man Like Darius. Man Like Darius came in and he hit some great moves. He hit a springboard. He hit a, uh, I think he went to hit a 450 and rolled out. And Kid Lycos, the ref was distracted and Kid Lycos 2 just went on a spree, nailing everyone with baking trays. It was glorious to watch and behold. Number five is Robbie X, and Robbie X pretty much eliminates Kid Lycos 2 straight away. So that makes that works well with what happened before with Robbie X picking up the loss in the previous match with Nick Wayne. So he gets a, a semi-win back there by getting a quick pinfall victory over Lycos. And he just hits insane move after insane move, insane dive, insane um, flurry. And it was really, really cool. Really cool way to sort of debut in this match. Like you do with Royal Rumbles, you get those rumble spots where people just go on an absolute tear. I thought it was great. And coming out at number six, we had Spike Trevay. Spike Trevay remains one of the best characters in progress wrestling by just delivering all of Cara Noir's moves on the opponents. He hits about three different um, swan move drop kicks to people in the corner. Thought that was great. And he just continued adding like little wrinkles of Car Noir in there, doing Car Noir poses and stuff like that. So it's really furthering that feud with Car Noir and Tom Dawkins. And yeah, he just worked heel for the rest of the match. He'd sort of roll to the outside. He'd do underhanded tactics. Great stuff, great character work from Spike. Then out comes Dan Maloney. He has a great flurry as well. And Danny Black is number eight. And he just hits insane move after insane move. So yeah really fun stuff where they just hit huge move after huge huge move because tisha hit an elevator slam like a suplex into a slam on robbie x which eliminated him to then eliminated tisha with a 450 and that's where it broke down between dan maloney and man like Darice. the 0121 collided after a sign of respect and they just start going after each other for the gold which i thought was great and that's when Spike really gets involved, you know. He hits Darice and then throws Dan Maloney. After after poking him in the eyes, he throws Dan Maloney onto Man Like Darice. And Dan Maloney pins Darice. The tag team is clo- it's bubbling over. It's bubbling over the 0 2 one is. And that was a great way to further it and make Spike look like an absolute dick. So I really, really appreciated that. Next person eliminated is Danny Black. He gets eliminated by Dan Maloney, and that leaves Maloney and Gene Money. Gene Money's been in since number one to take on Spike Trevay. And yeah, they had a really fun showdown. Um, breaks down with Spike stealing the pin from Maloney to take out Money. I believe it came from a spear. He hit a spear on him, Money. And then Spike dove in to steal that pin and the victory away. And then we got the victory. We got. Spike taking the key, the key that someone would win to give them a new championship opportunity. He used the key while the ref's back was turned on Maloney and picks up the win. Picks up a cheating win to win that the key. And he is essentially a number one contender for the Progress World Championship. He can cash that in whenever he wants, which is great for the vulture of pro wrestling when you think about it. This was a fun show. It was a fun match to end the night. Again, nothing really blow away apart from the opener and the Nick Wayne and Robbie X match. So one of the weaker shows from Progress. I'd give this a solid three out of five from me. It wasn't terrible by any means, but not by the standard that Progress have set. They've set, you know, a really high bar for me. Some of the best shows of the year. So I'm excited to see where this goes. And yeah. Let me know your thoughts on the show down in the comments below. I'll reply to every single one of them. Thank you all ever so much for your support and have a nice day.